got hired in their second summer of college. There you go. To start working in animation. Which is very typical at a place called CalArts. Most of you might know California Institute of the Arts, and this is where we both went. Yeah, if I remember right, I think half of our class was getting hired for work. Um, probably, I think, you know, maybe it was a cycle of heavy demand at that time. Could be. But the television world was looking for young people who wouldn't, who wouldn't charge them much for their services. And um, I think at least half of us got got into uh, some early early jobs, including your brother, yes. uh, Andrew. So Ed and I, the reason I also want to do this, we are, we've been friends for a long time. I think I met Ed when I was like 14, 15, when he was going to university with my older brother, Andrew Stanton. And eventually I learned to like him. Yes, eventually. And then we ended up working together at Colossal Pictures. Yes, and then we sort of Beard, and I think he went down to LA and then maybe came back up. And but I just want to, before we get too far, I just wanted to start with like, what are the jobs that you have done in animation? Okay, um, you by name or by or by uh, task? By task, right? Yes. So, okay, right, so uh, I've been a live action director, a documentary director, a music video uh, art, contributing artist, uh, I've been a, a layout artist in 2D. Um, what, it's a scene planning, I think they used to, that used to be an old, that used to be a, a role in 2D studios, scene planning, uh, where you go between the timing of the sheets or the animators overseas and the layout, the physical layouts, what they're going to see, what they're going to have to move, uh, doing that. Um, I've character design, right? I've done character design, I've done a bunch of that, uh, directed a lot of commercials as a, just a uh, kind of a go between, between the teams and the, uh, the clients. In different, different parts of the world. Um, what else? Uh, oh, voice director. Uh, voice directed about 100, maybe 150 different voices, including a bunch of enlisted people. You know, just out of chance. Yeah, it's been, oh, it's been a little bit of a Forrest Gump career where I just walked into things that led me to do things I never imagined I could do. So it's been a very interesting ride in that way. And you did animation as well. You were an animator, is that correct? Yeah, I was an animator when I first began. I okay. Think, yeah, I think I actually so got, you, like have done a little bit of. I did a little bit of animation. I worked on a, a film uh, at CalArts with a friend, a, a buddy of mine. It was the best animator in our class at the time, in our in our school at the time, like Tony Fuchilli. and um, he was one of the people who everybody was coming to along with the teachers. We had teachers like Hal Amro from the old Disney days, guys who you know, had, had worked on Lady and the Tramp, and uh, you know we we could just. Uh, we could only imagine being worthy of uh, his approval. But Tony was kind of the, the golden student out of everybody. And you've seen Tony's work all over the place because he was, he was, he was uh, what, responsible for Mufasa, I think, in the uh, Lion King. Yes, and I know him from when he came to Pixar and did all the Incredibles. Was he, so he was with Brad Bird when he came to Pixar, yes, right? Yes, that's, that's the Pichilli that I know is all of his yeah. design in that world. One of the things I got a chance to animate on with Tony was uh, with, as his assistant, his journey. Animator was uh, Brad Bird's first production as a director, uh, which was, uh, if you know anything about Brad Bird, uh, you know this was a really volatile situation for everybody. He took a, he took a story by Tim Burton and uh, they sold it to Amazing Stories and turned it into three short pieces for the for the anthology show Amazing Stories, which I think was a Touchstone maybe uh, program that came on and. Uh, there was a company in the Skid Row area of LA called Birdworks Studios. It was in a, yeah, it was, in, it was just on the other side of a tent city. Um, so we had to just kind of, kind of like wait, wait through all the, the unhoused and uh, get into our studio. There was about 15 or 16 people there to begin with. I think at the end, was, the crew was about 50 people. It was like Ralph Eggleston and uh, you know Tony Quichilli and a bunch of the bunch of the sort of second year, third year students that they got in as assistants. And that taught me a lot about animation and, and kind of gave me a lot of connect, context. That and what was the name of that segment? I can't remember. It was the Family Dog segment. That's it. I don't know if yeah. you guys have seen that. And that would have been, I, that's, I remember that was the buzz when I started at CalArts. So I think that premiered on television in 87, is that correct? It might have been 87. Probably would have been. I, was still, I was still trying to get through my classes. Yeah. That makes sense. I graduated. So that kind of leads me to my next question. What was your very first job, and how did you get it? Um, our very first job was, uh, well, my very first job was something that, you know, none of us could really go out and take our portfolios out there on our own. We didn't have the courage. So I, I always remember it as being a group situation. 
where a few of us got together, we gathered our courage at one time, and then went into LA from, from the school, from the university, and showed our portfolios to everyone we could. I eventually got hired by the, the Bagdazarians. It was a guy named Ross Bagdazarian, who was famous for, his dad created the, uh, the Chipmunks, uh, the uh, album and the Chipmunks, I believe the name was. So, um, not a big part of my, I'm not a big part of the fan base for that show, so or for that, that programming, but there was a lot of specials, a lot of Christmas specials. I believe we were involved in one of the Halloween specials they were doing for television at the time. Very low rent production, um, very, very complicated and um, strange uh, set of people that we were working for, but they were kind of our first lesson on what it was going to be like to be young and impressionable and have li very little experience would be um, exploited by the uh, by the Hollywood uh, world, maybe. Um, none and, of us, and what was the job you were doing? <laughs> well, I've asked all the, all the other friends of mine who got on that job, and none of us ever got paid for that gig. So we were hired as layout people. Taking to, we would take the cleaned up storyboards and turn those into much bigger, you know, full 12 field, you know, for the for the formatting of the for the animators and um, apparently the animators were going to be in Canada. I don't know if the film ever got the piece ever got made. So, but that was the uh, that was the structure that was set up, and that did it did train us a little bit. It gave us some. It gave us we we created some layouts for them that whether they used them or not didn't really matter because we could then take those folders and they were very official looking and we could take them around to other studios in the area, and that part of town in Glendale. And I ended up getting some getting a gig at Filmation on um, one of the I don't know one of the superhero maybe it was Super Friends I believe you know there were these programs that were coming on and were meant to sell toys that uh, were tended you know the animation tends to work at 24 frames a second these these tended to be like one drawing for every second of frame so it would be a single frame and as long as that drawing made sense and looked good then they, that would that constituted an animation for them? Yes, and we were of the of the generation where it was all Saturday morning cartoons. It's really where you could see your animation. Oh, so most of the animation. jobs, I would think, would be a lot like that. I, I'm just going to kick in some... Yeah. Just, I basically, the same thing I did, my span was 2D animation, because there were still, that was like the best way to get work, right? It was like, right. you learn that skill set, and they always right. needed in-betweeners, and that was not a bad way to get a job. And so that was my first job. Uh, I did 2D animation, I've done some layout, a little bit of wild brain, I did some, a yeah. little bit of keyframe animation, some 2D stuff, and then I went on to do storyboarding primarily at Pixar. And that's, that's the bulk, which is different, I was that, the bulk of my career. Do really. you think that early, the early stuff gave you some, a little confidence for the storyboarding? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I think people that do 2D animation can move into storyboarding really well, because they can already draw really well. And I had to break myself of making nice, pretty drawings, which is not what you're doing when you're storyboarding. But that right. helped a lot. Right. Yeah. You learn it's a you yeah, learn it very much. So. Like five, six different types of drawing and yeah. animation. So that was my first job. My yeah. first job, I moved to San Francisco after graduating from CalArts. Right. And got a job on the Nightmare before Christmas. That is not normal to get into something so highbrow. But because I always talk about it, it was just I had a friend, a classmate who was doing the 2D animation. Right. And I happened to just be friends with him, I would have lunch with him once a month, we'd see movies and hang out, sure enough, when he was doing the 2D animation, it was piling up, Yeah, and he didn't have an assistant. So he literally okay. called me up and was like, hey, do you want to come in and be my assistant on this movie? And okay. of course, I was like, are you, are you serious? Like, absolutely. So that's how I got onto that movie, was just to be somebody's assistant doing 2D animation. That's kind of how I got into Bert, uh, Brad Bird's first production. Tony was just used to me following him around everywhere, asking him about in-between and, you know, timing. Uh, and uh, you know, helping me reanimate scenes in my films. So that once we got something finished, and he saw that I could complete something, he, he invited me to come in and work on it. And that's, I love that, because it's just all about like knowing the right person, yeah. kind of being at the right place at the right time. A lot of my career ended up being that way, because after I did that, I went to Colossal Pictures, which is where I sort of re-met Ed, and that was a wonderful commercial 2D animation house. Yeah, Colossal was, um, it was a, such a cool place. It was a place up in the Bay Area where Angelinos, the folks working in the Hollywood area, kind of looked at it as a, a sort of city on the hill, you know, because it wasn't one of these limited studios that was intended for you to do 
one style while you were there the whole time, right? It was one of those places where in one corner there was stop motion happening, in another corner there was experimental animation, in another corner there was sort of abstract, you know, moving images, and there was live action happening, and they were doing special effects for the Top Gun movie, and, you know, it was, a, it was an opportunity to kind of learn everything you could about filmmaking, rather than getting stuck in one department and doing, you know, He-Man storyboards for 10 years, you know, which some of our some of our elders, some of the teachers at the school at Cal Arts were actually doing it. That was their career. It was entire their whole career basically until they retired. Um, so I think we had that as an option, you know. This and is I, true. I went up to to Colossus trying to escape that fate, essentially. I, I was just looking for work. Like I finished oh, Nightmare okay. and was like, okay, where can I find work that's going to keep me employed? Is that and, where you met Henry Selleck? No, no, I, I met Henry on Nightmare. Like so. Production. On the production. Yeah, imagine like no every experience, but Cal Arts taught me the skill set and got me the job. But what I do remember is, was going to Colossal and, and I think it was Scott Tomey looking at my portfolio and, just, and I was like, oh, clearly this guy's probably seen a million of these. He had zero interest. And then as soon as he saw the copies of the work I had done on Nightmare, he was like, oh, okay, when can you start? Like, that's when I realized, oh. If you get a certain job that means something, it comes to get another job that means something else. And that was a, that, that was a very eye-opening for me, and that's, that's, that's how I got it. Some recruiters are very uh, decisive in that way, you know? They'll, they just have to see one thing, get a good look in your eye, they can see you got a work ethic, and they're like, you're hired. Um, yeah, but I, what you're saying about the, yeah. the variety of work, I love that. Like, there would be some weeks when I would work on an Allstate commercial, that's it. fire effects on a Coca-Cola color, yeah. and then there would be like a yeah. Nickelodeon ad. Right. And they were all radically different. And uh, as, as a young guy, it was like really yeah. fun to, to hone your skills and, to, and work with a bunch of different people. And just watch what these what folks were doing and th th things that you didn't know how to do already. So Henry was one example of that. He was hiring all these people who were brand new in 2D and uh, stop motion animation, some coming out of 2D. Um, a lot of them ended up being the crew of animators on uh, films that will become later that are considered classics now, like Coraline. Like you know? And I met those guys when they were just kids, you know, doing those, those uh, Pillsbury Doughboy commercials. He said he produced about a hundred of those things before he got a feature gig. So uh, that was the kind of thing that was going on. Yeah, and he did all those uh, MTV snippets too, this oh, wonderful yeah. stop motion. This is when yeah, MTV yeah. was an actual channel. Yeah, he played Colossal, had music a, videos. Colossal had a relationship with MTV at the time when, when MTV was a thing, you know, that people actually watched. And at the time, uh, I think they were also doing casting for the real world in the, out of our building. This somewhere. is true. Yep. Because the first one was in San Francisco, if I remember correctly. When I, when I first arrived, before I got my, my first day of work, uh, they were wrapping a video of Prince over in, the, over in the live action building that George Ebert apparently did the design for. So, you know, there's a lot of weird connections in that place. Well, that's, and that's one of the reasons I wanted to do this talk, was just, just to show anybody, like, when you get this job, at least the next thing, and if, it, if it's a place like a commercial house, you end up working on a bunch of random stuff. I was starting to hone my skills at that point, realizing, hey, I think I'm not too bad at this 2D effects thing, and I like doing it. Yeah. And then I was, you know, everything that we had watched in the 80s, right. most of those movies, beyond models and things, mm -hmm. and all those effects were done with 2D, like hand-run effects. So I yeah. finally, through, again, some connections that I had made on Nightmare, I got an interview at ILM, and I was so excited, and I showed him my stuff, and the guy was like, Oh man, your stuff is great. We totally could have used you like 10 or 20 years ago. <laughs> and it was it was so devastating, but I also realized, yeah, I think 2D effects is not really happening anymore. The technology was so quickly changing as we just even as we began to get into the industry, uh, everything, the way that things were being done was shifting. Yeah, okay, this is this is my next question. Yeah. Okay. So I'm, I'm excited to talk about this because we are of a generation where CG was not a, a big thing. It was not a tool that was readily, readily available. Right. It wasn't being used a lot. But but right. during our time, which is sort of similar, you had movies yeah. like Tron that came out in mm -hmm. 1982. You also had Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan, has that amazing planet right. sequence. And then you have um, the incredible scene in Young Sherlock Holmes, which I think is 1985, when the night pops. That's one of the first things that the early Pixar guys did. Yep. The stained glass night pops out of the window, and I remember seeing that in the theater, and I was like, what is this magic that I'm seeing on the screen? I had never seen anything like that. And then you have The Abyss, which is several years later, but that about is that. mind blowing. And then the, the big deal after that is Toy Story, uh, is Terminator 2, which is, you know, Terminator, you, Terminator 2 has all those effects. Yeah, the right. big deal yeah. is Jurassic Park, and that's 1993. And so I remember that movie comes out, and that just 
certainly for ILM, just blew the roof off. And that was the year that I was working on Nightmare Before Christmas. Right. And uh, the most archaic thing possible. But I remember that going to see... Though, had, had John made his short film? He would have. Because remember, two years later is Toy Story, and that also blows the lid off of, of so just the animation. So came before Toy Story, right? Yes. And there was a, wasn't there a baby in that? Yeah. Their child in that? Yeah. Yeah. Wasn't that the ugliest thing we'd ever yes, seen? Yes, the ugliest yeah. thing. But I, yeah. but the, I guess what I'm trying to ask is, like, I... It, it was during our careers, so I, my question to you is, did you... Were you already using a computer at, at, at that time? Did you, or, did you embrace it? Did you run away from it? Because I was one of those people that was like, I want nothing to do with CG, so I ran to the place that was doing the most of it. Well, I think, because they, I I think that do. was kind of guiding me and other people who were trying to be character animators, was that you needed repetition in order to learn how to do it. Like, it was the kind of thing where you could practice, you could do, you could do short films in school, but that was kind of the equivalent of um, having done your scales on the piano. But being able to play a symphony or, you know, to actually really do the thing was, a, was another thing. It was going to take a lot of experience. So our thing was to try to find gigs that would allow us to just do the character animation. So we could actually get good enough at it to compete with the very best people. That was what was always driving me when I got to Colossal. I kept asking them to give me character animation. And they kept saying, well, you know what? You could direct this thing. Or, hey, could you do some color on this thing here before you do the animation? Or, uh, you know, hey, we heard you were good at layouts. When I got to Colossal, I had just come off of an infamous show, a uh, television show, that was being created in LA, and that was creating a big, a big, a big uh, stir in the world of uh, sort of Nickelodeon cartoon network. This is Ren and Stimpy. The show Ren and Stimpy. Yeah, yeah. most people know. Kind of an infamous program because the people involved, the creators, uh, became infamous later on. Uh, but it, you know, there was, there was a lot of uh, graduates from Sheridan College who also had a lot to teach us about character animation. So I was very attracted to that, that studio for that reason, the Spone Co. studio. Um, yeah, they were a little bit like Trey and, Trey and uh, you know, uh, Trey Parker of uh, the South Park uh, world in terms of like how they thought about Hollywood and the animation industry in general, which was as, as much as they could piss people off if they would like to. And that was just the measure of how whether the show was successful enough or not, is how much it irritated the, the world of the grown-ups who had kids watching their cartoons. And so that was a different kind of ethic that we, you know, we, I could kind of uh, play around with. I had a hard time, a little bit of a hard time there uh, at Spunko for the same reason that I had a hard time with Ralph Bakshi and his company, just that same year, you know, we went from... I don't know if these folks know Ralph Bakshi, but he was rather notorious uh, character that you actually got to work for closely. Right. Oh, yeah, the first time he met me, he said, oh, look, we got a Negro in here. Yes. Yeah, that sounds like Rob Baxi. Yes. And then he spent five minutes telling me how he was roommates with Miles Davis back in the 60s. And that was why we were going to get along great and be brothers. Um, That's the first meeting of, yeah. I'm not right, I think the first day I saw him pinch a woman's ass was the first day I got to work at his place. Um, yeah, this was a situation um, in the 80s where uh, the young animator didn't know what was coming. So we didn't know, we, we, didn't, we had no one to tell. There was no human resources at any of these studios to go to and say, is it okay that they're calling me these names? Is it all right that my producer threw a hamburger at me today? Oh my God. Because this, the scene didn't this look is good. Mighty Mouse that you were working with my brother on, yeah. right? That's Grog. Yeah, because yeah, Andrew was working as a writer on there. There were a lot of very funny people in our class who, who, whose sort of humor almost like uh, overwhelmed the animation they were creating. Most of us created short films that we took on, took to festivals, because you know, we liked the fact that animation would let us travel. So when we got a short film done, which was a miracle at school, um, and we were all working on each other's films, so we would put, our, put the credits on there, and everybody who had a credit on the film could go with us to the, you know, out to the festivals. That was how we met Ralph Bakshi, and we got hired on, uh, onto uh, Mighty Mouse, because he figured we, you know, we were doing these sort of, you know, very, uh, irreverent kind of humor yeah. in a lot of our films, yeah. and I think they were attracted to that. And eventually those same crew kind of matriculated over to Ren and Stimpy for the same Yeah, reason. but a lot of that same crew, am I right in thinking, went on to go create The Simpsons, is that yeah. correct? Yeah. yeah, quite a few of them. In fact, uh, Rich Moore ended up winning several Emmys for some of my, my favorite episodes of The Simpsons, you know, after being on it for about five years. Jim Reardon was one of, uh, one of the head writers on the Mighty Mouse show. He went on to on the substance for most of his career actually yeah quite a bit of it and then he came up and worked on wally which was kind of exciting to sort of, i knew him and to sort of get to work with that's him right i'm so excited we came up in the area yeah yeah 
So again, just buy a lot of these stories. It's like you just never know where these groups of people are going to meander. And, and, yeah, it's a strange winding path. Yes, yeah. yeah. So I, I do want to go back to the CG question because for me, I remember realizing, oh my God, everything's going to start to move into this like in 1993. And I, you yeah, know, the only reason I didn't embrace it 100 percent was because I was being told like you got to pay attention to the thing you're doing. Like, your your craft is is, is never going to go away. This 2D thing. Yeah. And it's only going to be the, it's going to be the thing that that CG people are going coming to you for the knowledge of how to bring something to life. So stay on it, but keep keep an eye on the technology. Watch and see yeah. what's happening. Yeah, a lot of it, for me, it was because I was in the Bay Area and I loved the Bay Area. I really didn't want to move back to L.A. And I was just like, what am I going to do to find work? And I really wanted to get back into the movies. So ironically enough, I was like, well, the one place that's changing everything, Pixar, with CG, I was like, I can go there for the storyboarding job. I was very excited. They just had a hiring wave. So again, right place, right time, they just needed people for a bug's life. And I was like, okay, if I can get into this place right. and learn storyboarding, I don't have to do a computer, because it was not what Toy I wanted Toy to do. Toy Story and Bug's Life, there were some commercials created that I thought were Yeah, they were on the tail end. Yeah. yeah. But that's, I sort of escaped doing computer work by going to the place that was doing the top, top end. And I, it worked out. I was able to hone that skill and just stay there for many, many years because they were turning out the movies. Using basically 2D skills to support a 3D project. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Um, but that was a big change. I remember that. Well, and ironically enough, 1994, Lion King comes out. And then there's like this resurgence of 2D. So you have, I remember that those years in the 90s, there was this really interesting, like, exciting upswing of 2D projects, but CG was clearly like this force to be reckoned with that was, I mean, once, again, Jurassic Park, like, that changed everything. Yeah, like Jim would say, it was too big to ignore. Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. Um, oh, yeah, so I think our careers, like, I ended up going to a place like Pixar also because in the States, in order to get really good health care, you had to get a good job, and that company provided you health care. That was that's a big deal. And so one of the things also is Pixar was giving you stock options. That was a big deal. I was probably looking for that, but that, that was a, a big incentive to keep you working at a place like that. The real uh, downside of moving up to SF to go to Colossal was that there was no union. There was no union up there. So, you, But your, your career has mostly been freelance. Is that correct? Or you, or you, uh, maybe you have longer stretches at places that I, I'm unaware of. After Roger Rabbit... Um, right, and we can't gloss over that, that this guy worked on Roger Rabbit, which is amazing. Yeah, there was the whole, you know, there was the whole inculcation into the Disney sort of world, and there was like the two-day orientation that they had. That was back when it was very intense when you got a job at Disney Animation. Uh, they wanted to make sure that you were going to dress the right way and not have too heavy of a beard and all these things that people don't believe that they did that now, but... Um, they took you through a whole orientation where you got to see all the videos and see, listen to, uh, uh, see the old, old uh, reels of Walt himself telling you how to behave yourself while you're at the company and how to be a good member of the, you know, right before you got your tag with the mouse on it and everything. Um, but, the, but the Roger Rabbit show itself was more of a Richard Williams thing in the end. You know, it was more of a connection with Britain. It was more of a, you know, there was a, it wouldn't have been the film that it was without Richard and his crew. So most of us ended up kind of find, falling in love with that, that level of animation, looking at that commercial house that he came up with in London and thinking, well, that's, that's kind of the dream for animation. That's where animation should go, because he was doing all these different things that you didn't so, get to see. Did you move to London for the job? Were you in London? No, I stayed in LA. They had the, the small unit in uh, Burbank. And that was run by the Bears. I don't know if you know Dale Bear and his, his Dale and Jane Bear. I know the name, but I never met him. Just great, yeah, great animation with the Disney kind of family that uh, kind of took over that. And they were his assistant directors on that in the LA. Area. So Bruce Smith was my kind of boss, like my main, like supervising animator on that. Bruce went on to form, uh, to, to create the Proud Family, and we did Bay Base Kids together. Um, and you know, there were, there were a lot of union jobs actually during LA because. Even in even at school at Cal Arts, we had to we had to find a way to get some to get our union dues together, get scrape that money together before we could get the gigs in places like Filmation, because the union was very strong. And I never dealt with them in the barrier. They're just using the union. That was the thing. There. Yeah, once we got up there, I realized that I didn't have to pay the dues, but also I didn't get the same rights either, or the same protections. So it was a real trade-off. That's what it's going to be. You know, I knew if we, if we moved to London, it would be the same thing. So right after Roger Rabbit, um, a lot of those people were, were, some of those animators were heading back to Europe, and they invited us to come and visit them, just to come and s to stay for a week and say hello oh, and see what the studios were like in London, and Germany, and France maybe. And um, 
that was a dream for me because I, I mean, I'd never been anywhere on the planet other than LA. So I went straight out to Germany and worked on a German feature. I just took a job. You know, I took a job in the first place that would offer one to me, and it was a German feature called Peter Gans Mondfart. Uh, what a great title. Uh, <laughs> Peter's Trip to the Moon. Okay. It was a best-selling children's book at the time uh, in the German language. So I had to learn to, to phonetically animate in German all the dialogue. And uh, it definitely expanded my mind as a young Angelino. I can imagine. And I like what you just said there. You just, you're often just looking for it. Like, whatever job is the one that you can find yeah, is the like, one that you often That grab. was what Tony's advice was. To take something where they gave you the animation to do They just threw animation at you and said, make this character come to life, because that was the only way you were going to really learn to do it. Exactly. You know, the first 10 years you're an animator, you're still full of questions about what the hell you're doing. You know, you come to every single, every job feeling like you're starting at zero, you know? This, you know, and this is the kind of thing that Glenn Keane would say in his advice, you know, when we were at Disney on Roger Rabbit, he would come over and give, up, give us advice constantly, because he knew us from CalArts. Glenn was a nice guy. He used to work all day at Disney and then come up and do a 7 o'clock to 9 o'clock or 7 to 10 class at CalArts just because he couldn't get enough of drawing and talking about art. Um, he's one of those kind of generous spirits. I had the same experience. Most of yeah. the teachers I had were working during the day and then right. come up and teach. Several, most of my classes were from 7 to 10, yeah. which is kind of crazy, but you were yeah. learning directly from the guys. And then they right. often bring stuff from work, even though they probably weren't supposed to. Right. But the, my layout teacher, my animation teacher, the, the uh, character designer, Joe Ramsey, all yeah, those guys. Yeah, yeah. That's right. Like Giamo, I had Mike Giamo as a teacher. All those um, people were. Yeah, I yeah. think I had one of your classmates as my animation, yes. Russ Edmonds. Okay. Was my animation. Yeah, and this is a who's who of sort of that 90s yeah. um, resurgence of animation, animated features that were coming out of Disney, Bluth, um, a, a few different studios, but mostly Disney. Um, so that was kind of the training that we got. And I think, uh, I think a lot of us were rebelling against that stuff by the time Roger Rabbit came around. So when they it seemed sense. such a different project that a lot of us were jumping at the, chopping at the bit to get in there and get that gig. And I felt so lucky that they actually hired me. Because again, like if, without experience in animation, you don't feel like very confident in it. You have to have done a few characters and had to, you know, had the whole process in your under your belt before you felt confident. Yeah, and finding that first job is it's tricky, man. I remember yeah. I, I canvassed that summer in LA when yeah. I graduated and just it was really hard to find work. So yeah. I said, you know what? I'm gonna move to San Francisco and I just I really want to live there. It's nothing to do with work. And all my friends were like, Are you insane? Why are you moving to San Francisco? Everything's here and I was like, I don't care. Maybe I'll come back, and I just happened to know the guy who came on Nightmare, and that was it. Really. I'm always surprised that you had a hard time finding anything, you know, finding stuff down there, because it just seemed like it was a time when, when people I weren't in there. I didn't have an experience. Yeah, yeah. that was the thing. Was That's really hard to like. Yeah, they wanted to know well, how, how much have you put in? How yeah, and you're like, months, years? Nothing. Yeah, but getting, I mean, there's, it, it, the insanity of getting onto a movie like Nightmare, I, it, it, I don't understand it even now, and it, but that was just more like a guy that was doing 2D animation that needed an assistant. And it's as simple as that, and I just happened to know him. Definitely, yeah. <laughs> and I remember showing up like the first day, and it was like, okay, and I signed up my payroll, yeah. and started working, you know, and then Henry right. was like, who's this guy? What's he doing? You meet all these guys on a story team. Yeah, yeah. And, and then you sort of, that was the year the movie came out as well. So that was also an introduction to people what it's like to be burned out on a movie, because I was like, super enthusiastic, like, isn't this amazing? We're making oh, this yeah, movie. And was... then I would meet people just like, I was, I was dead, you know, it was they a 90 hour movie for like three years, you know, and then, and then I understood when I finally worked on my first movie from from the beginning, I'm like, oh yeah, I got two, three years in, you're just knackered, you know, but, uh, have done some of those things in LA because the union wouldn't have allowed those hours. Right, yeah. I don't think a lot of the, some of the great stuff that we creatively see in, that's in pop culture now wouldn't have been created without some of those things happening in Canada or San Francisco. So, I'm going to ask this just before we run out of time. What's, what's, what is the most unusual job that you got that you just never thought that you would ever do? Or didn't even think about it? Or just something strange that you were like, I can't believe I'm doing this job. So after, so, so they were taking pictures at uh, Colossal Pictures uh, from the MTV side. Uh, one of the executive producers there, uh, Albi, had come up with this concept called Liquid Television, which was where he could try to bring the... Yeah. I think his concept was to bring the outside, the kind of outsider art uh, film festival, like worldwide film festival vibe to television, 
right? And sort of create something that was more for grown-ups and less for, the, for children. Kind of a, an answer to the, the new Nickelodeon that was just now starting, just, just beginning at that time, right? Um, and he took sort of open pitches, and for some reason, uh, I, did, I decided to do something that was totally against all the things that everybody else was doing. Um, I decided to do something in 2D, nothing, you know, nothing too particularly special about it, but it was about a, my best friend at the time was a young woman named Nola Kambanda, and uh, she was from, uh, from Rwanda, and had come over with two of her sisters and her mom, uh, getting away from the troubles, the troubles. And um, one of the families that I was uh, involved with was taking people in. I, mean, our, I was in the church at the time. My, uh, my church was doing a lot of, a lot of work with uh, Rwandans uh, who were coming over as new immigrants or new people who hadn't gotten their visas yet, who weren't really settled into LA, helping them get there. So that's how I got to be friends with Nola. And um, Nola was a, a mathematician, like a real numbers nerd, who was really only concerned with like, either teaching math or finding a job at Lockheed or you know, one, of the, you know, one of the big big tech firms out there in LA doing you know, aerospace. She was like an aerospace nut. And um, at, the, at the same time, based on her appearance, everywhere we went in LA, people treated her like she was a model, right? So she, they decided that she had to be some sort of, some sort of uh, uh, fashion model that, and that would naturally would be what everybody would aspire to. So they would, they would come and give her these offers and she'd say, no, thank you. And they'd say, oh, uh, great, I see you're, 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 a, you're a hard, driving a hard bargain. We're gonna come back with a bigger offer. And that was my experience of her was being, it was her being totally uh, misunderstood by the people she was around and trying to become friends with. She was a very open-hearted person who was like meeting all these, these new people in LA who really were just Hollywood nutbags. Um, so that, how did that inform your pitch too? I decided to do my, to, to do my, uh, my first piece, the, the pilot for the show that I was uh, pitching to them uh, was we're gonna do, uh, basically, it's just the story of Nola coming over from her country, and instead of LA, I chose, I decided it was New York, and I called it the big city, and um, we decided, we made a, we made a, basically a 12 minute short, musical short, I got uh, a lot of the musicians from Cal Arts that we grew up with to do the soundtrack, and it ended up being, you know, it ended up being made, which was kind of a miracle, because the pitch wasn't very, wasn't very cohesive or together, but I did a storyboard, and they loved it, and they said yes. And they said yeah to it. Yeah, and then Colossal was on that. They put some of the artists in Bob. And uh, we ended up winning a bunch of awards, and it, it, uh, it traveled well. It, it, was, uh, it didn't have a lot of dialogue in it. I think that's one reason why it ended up traveling. But we ended up going to, to places like uh, Montreal to show it off. You know, places like, uh, what, in Japan, we went to Hiroshima. There's a big kind of festival there. Um, and it just it kind of grew my mind in a way that I just didn't know the animation could kind of do that for you. On that scale, it's wild. Was it part of the Liquid Television? It was program? part of the whole Liquid Television yeah. program. Yeah, when it came yeah. out and premiered, you know that all, a bunch of us all premiered at the same time. With a bunch of us who had pitched our things, and uh, within a month or so, we were seeing our names in these magazines around LA, the Interview magazine, Esquire, all these things. And suddenly, Liquid Television was a thing, you know, in pop culture. And um, and then we started going to the festivals, and that was what led them to have the direct things at uh, Glasgow. Ah, uh, that totally makes sense. Yeah. So it, it, I love that story because it's just, you, you never know when you pitch something yeah. where it's going to go, right? Yeah. I, I think for me, the weirdest thing was that probably that first job on Nightmare, one of the things I had to do was do a lot of rotoscoping, which is really not fun to do. Yeah. But we had to project a frame at a time onto this paper, and then I would trace it. Remember that on Roger. Too. Yeah. And then I would yeah. have to give it to the guy that was doing all the effects animation, which is, oh, was, would have been Jack on Fire and things like that. But one of the things I had to learn how to do was load this down shooter. They would give me clips of film, and I learned, I learned how to like open the magazine up and deal with film. I never thought I would have a job where I was doing something that I had never even thought about doing. Right. And then I had to learn how to shoot the animation. We would paint all the cells and then shoot it, and I'd have to go into the, into the dark room and load and unload in the dark. I, I never thought I would handle film. It was probably the only time I ever did that, which was really cool. It was yeah. really kind of fun to do all the time. Uh, Nerve-wracking, but kind of fun. The other thing was I ended up on A Bug's Life at the end. They were running out of time, and remember back then, this is their second feature, and there was a lot of organic stuff moving around in that movie, and they didn't really know how to do a lot of it well. And there was a scene where Rosie throws her web or rope at P.T. Flea, and, and he's like, oh, and he gets wrapped up. They couldn't do it, and they were, they were just struggling, and they knew I had done 2D animation, so they asked, hey, could you, do you think you could animate this shot? Because it needs to get done. 
And I was like, okay. So I just gave it a whirl. It's very short. It's like two shots of her throwing the rope at you, like through the camera. And then the second shot was like a, uh, another layer of the rope, just like covering the camera really fast. Okay, that's done in too deep. Doing the smoke or flames? No, 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 no. That was the only shot, and they, no one really knows it because it's all CG. But and then some poor staff in the art department had to paint every single frame that I animated and, and make it like look like uh, motion blur. And, you know, uh, it's super short. But I didn't yeah. expect it. It's probably the only thing I've ever animated ever actually on the screen. <laughs> Most of the work I do now is all storyboarding. Nobody sees it. Right. Um, yeah, but it was fun to do. trying to escape the tedium by doing storyboards. You're kind of trying to escape the tedium of the frame by frame. Well, honestly, you know, for me, it was more just wanting to work on movies. Yeah. That was the job that was available. Yeah. It just happened to be. And this is what happened yeah. after Colossal also decided to not do yeah. commercials anymore. Right. I'm, I'm sure that affected both of us. And I was sort of like, where do I go? Yeah, I went to Wild Brain. Yeah, at that point we were starting to go into, into pitching features. So they, all of us who had come from LA, they started sending us back down there with uh, uh, guys like John Stevenson and uh, and uh, Cindy Woodburn. I don't know if you remember Cindy from the Amelin. I had met her when I was over in Europe, and uh, she came to. They hired her there to work on the features and head that whole thing up. So we, I spent three years at Colossal attempting to get them uh, to get them a feature. I see. To get made, and then nothing really came. Of nothing. Uh, great relationships came of it, you know. We, had, <laughs> yeah. we met Jerry Jewell, Jerry Jewell, who was the the writer of the the, the Muppets uh, Christmas Carol, oh, yeah, wow. and uh, Muppets Save from New York, and Muppet and the Muppet, you know, all these. Which I was, a, I'm a mad, crazy fan of the Henson Company, so I'm like an insane nerd for that thing. So I felt like it was an honor to get to even meet this guy, and he taught us a lot about story. Um, he would have us go to go up to his house in Mendocino, and he would develop and break the script on the the, new, the King Tut movie. And then later, it was, there was another film uh, that was brought to us by Nothing Outsider um, about a New Orleans uh, witch and voodoo and all stuff. And we started working on that together. And that led to another insane, uh, totally unexpected uh, meet encounter with someone I never thought I would know. Um, the music producer who was being, uh, they, were, they were talking to music producers and and uh, trying to figure out who was going to do the soundtrack because they wanted to lead their pitch with we have a, a really big, uh, great, you know, large A-list person to do the, uh, the soundtrack. And so one of the people they had been talking to was Quincy Jones, who was interested in Colossal Pictures because he had been watching them. He was one of those people who pays attention to all media. He kind of sees what's going on. He knows what the radio stations are doing. He knows what the animation companies are doing. He's just a, he's an autodidact and a real genius. And, um, Somehow, some way, uh, from up there in San Francisco, we ended up getting a visit from Quincy Jones, and he signed on as a producer to this this New Orleans picture. Uh, I think it was called The Legend of Soul, and he 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 had a picture of how the soundtrack would be, but all the music, the songs, and all those things. And he was just coming off the third Michael Jackson album, so it's not like he was not busy, you know. But he was one of the most generous uh, individuals I've ever worked with in, in entertainment. He was, uh, he kind of welcomed us into his, his LA uh, facility, his like family, and gave us all like name tags and mission. Like, we were never gonna be there, we didn't spend any time there. But he sort of, he, he made it, you know, like you're gonna be part of our whole thing. Like I'm a mogul, and you are you guys are struggling in studio that we think should make features. So let's see how, how far we can, our support can get you. And how long did that development process last? I, I think we ended up going and doing uh, collective pitches with Quincy in the room to so about 13 studios around LA including some of the music houses like Polydor, Polygram, because you know, everybody wants to get into movies, right? Uh, so anyone who wanted to actually have them sit in a room with the great Quincy Jones would take the meeting and get the pitch. It gave us a lot of great experience, you know? I pitched to Lisa Henson, I pitched to, uh, I think Brad was, was in there at one point, uh, as in the room, you know, as a, as a listener. Um, we went to Paramount, Disney, all the different, all the different most of the movies that we've tried to get made uh, in my lifetime have not gotten made. So this is one of those examples of uh, where we took away ex an experience and something from the from the, the, the development of the film that was other than the film itself, right? Because we had this long-standing relationship that came later. That ended up, you know, we ended up doing other projects with those people. Yeah, I love that because it's true. In animation, as most of you know. You end up working on a lot of stuff that just never gets made. Yeah, it never sees the light of day. I remember on Toy Story 2 meeting uh, Ricky Nirmo, who's a great character designer, and he, he showed up and everything that he had worked on had not been made. 
everything. He had not worked on one thing that had been made. And he's one of the best. And he's one of the best. And I remember he came up and he's like, what is it, what is it like to work on a movie that actually gets made? And I, I was like, really? And I, and I had never experienced that. Like, I, I still had something. Like, maybe once or twice post-Pixar, I've worked on a few things. But at that point, that was the beauty of working for like, a well-funded studio that function is everything you're going to work on is going to come out. Did so, you work on Peach after Nightmare? I did. Yeah, because both Nightmare and Peach were miracles. They are yeah, projects it's getting true. made. Yeah. It wasn't like they were a shoe in. You know, it was like a struggle with the studio the whole time. But yeah, yeah. So I out. never had that experience. So he, he, I get to see he just was like had come out of the darkness. And was oh, like, man. how am I gonna get to work on something that people are gonna actually see? Holy and, uh, crap. But I realized, yeah, that's somebody's. That, that's an entire existence if you're just developing stuff and pitching. And, and then that happens to the best people. We, we know Brenda, my wife and I know Brenda Chapman really well, and her husband, Kevin yeah, Lima. Yeah. And those guys are like, they are Oscar winners, and they, they, they made right. great movies. And even them, it's like, oh, we'll talk to them, and they're like, yeah, last two years we've been developing projects, pitching around, nothing. That's great. right. It's just, yeah. it's just part of the deal. Right. No, even Tarantino has his slow years where he's just like, no one's listening. Um, and it's just something we kind of got used to, the idea in LA, that it wasn't a shoe-in once you got past a certain door, you know, that there were lots of other doors that you were still going to have to get through before the thing actually got made. Then once a production was done, there was the whole idea of getting it released, right? And so the people could actually, could actually see it. Because there are also films that we put a lot of work into, or television programs we put work into, pilots, that people never got to see, right? They just went on the shelf in some studio. And that, that's such a painful thing, especially in animation. Heartbreaking. You know how much work goes into those projects. Do you think uh, traditional animation will survive? Yeah, I think, I, I mean, it still does. It's just a matter of, I don't think you're going to see the breadth of studios like DreamWorks or Disney that are going to pay like, big budget movies like that. I think, I think, you know, a lot of them just aren't doing that anymore. But I mean, obviously in Europe, European tune animation is like amazing. And, and that I think, the, I think as an art form, it's never going to go away. But I think maybe like big budget, but we're already seeing it. There's 2D animated features. You're just not seeing them anymore. You've spoken about how the industry has transitioned from traditional animation through to like 3D and more CGI. And now that we're seeing like new phases of technology come in and influence storytelling, like you know, like uh, push towards mobile, uh, social media, short form, and especially AI. Uh, what do you guys spot as the opportunities and threats? And similarly, like that deals with the technology side, but then also the culture of like animation as an industry side. Like you've already described, like working with Banshee and working at Disney Sound of like Mouschwitz. But um, like, how is that side changing, and is it changing for the better? I spent a year on a VR project last year um, that was uh, intended to revolutionized the medical industry by making MRIs and CT scan setups uh, more, what's the word, uh, more user-friendly for young people, for kids. Because one of the problems with getting a good uh, scan and reading on children is they move too much. So some, some innovators out in uh, Montreal got together with a Russian uh, animation team and um, one of our ex-colossal friends, uh, Hunter, uh, was at that time had become a producer, done a lot of, a lot of directing commercials. He, uh, he became the kind of overall producer for that, brought me in to design the characters and help him create the experience for them as a VR experience for kids from about, I think, three to about maybe seven years old, um, where they would have something that they could do, kind of gamify the experience that five or ten minutes they had to sit there and be still. And um, just do it with characters and sort of a call and response and with things that they could, um, you know, that they could uh, uh, put their focus on rather than all the noise around them and the un how uncomfortable the machine was. And that was my first experience, you know, first delving into using my talents in a new media, right? And since then, there have been a lot of other, you know, when we go to film festivals now, like the, the VR and AR kind of concept is, is getting a little bit uh, conflated now with AI because I think AI is going to be one of the ways that big tech companies are going to use to uh, to sell us VR, you know, to do, because there are things that they haven't been able to get, to, to quite get to, to get it out to market yet. You know, they thought by now all of us would be living in a VR world, right? If Meta had anything to say about it, right? But that was one of the more um, kind of, I guess, forward-thinking kind of gigs that I've done. 
and as a teacher, as a teacher at the university level, um, AI is something that our department is embracing, and it means for us that we're learning how to give good prompts. Essentially, you know, we're learning how our words are coming back to being important again, and that being articulate with our creative concepts is something that we have to push more to our students. Because, you know, most, most kids who are visual artists just want to draw. They don't want you asking them to explain what they're drawing. It's like, that's anathema to everybody. But we're having to try and turn that around in the culture and make them re realize that they may not be the person who's on the other end of the pencil. They may be having to tell a computer to do it rather than do it themselves. I, yeah, well, I mean, I'm, I'm a little old school when it comes to tech, but like, I think all of these things are exciting for the just, I think it just means more opportunities. For anybody out there about what's to get an animation, especially with the, with the streaming platforms, there's there's all these different things that you can do and different ways to do animation. I think AI is just like a tool, like any other tool. Um, I, I I'm still sort of like my world is feature films. That's pretty much like what I do, and that's all I've really done. <laughs> so I don't think I'm going to veer too far from that world. I don't think stick with animation. And I'm doing a lot of I'm an assistant director now, so like that's I'm just looking at things like that and writing. And, but it's exciting. I, I, I don't know where it's going to go. Um, but it, I think AI in particular is just, it is a tool that I, I don't really get. I don't know why you want to use it. But, but it's nice to know that someone like Enz in the teaching world is like, yeah, we're going to have to talk to our students to, to use it properly, you know? You know, being in, a, in, ac in academia with animation means that you've got to keep up and you've got to at least try to understand the things that you would rather, because as an artist, I'm still trying to focus on, on mastering the stuff that I had to, you know, to storytelling and, you know, storytelling through images and, you know, animation itself. Um, but these are sort of distractions that you kind of have to welcome and allow into your life, you know, as, as animation grows, you know? If you guys had, uh I know your, your very own studio with an infinite budget. Uh, are there any projects that you guys want to be working on at this point, or uh, kind, of, kind of different roles you want to uh, take over for you know future projects? I guess. <laughs> well, I mean, I think for me it's just more what I would want to do and employ the, the people that I know, like I have other folks, like I. I'd love to be able to make my own feature animated film, like my own story. I, I, I'm a big horror movie fan, so like that's a bucket list thing. It's to be kind of fun to make a little bit more something a little bit more extreme of animation that, that you might not sell, not that big money. But I think I think having a studio where you can have people being able to try different things and have features and shorts. That's one of the things I liked about Pixar was that we had these shorts being developed and they would put them in front of the movie. I thought that was a really cool way for them to try different things. And, the envelope and give someone a, a chance to try some different things. Um, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I think, my, I guess my dream would be, if that was real, would be a place that did, you know, hand drawn animation, stop motion, and CG, like a little bit. I like all those things, you know, like being able to do it all. <laughs> yeah, there have been some great examples of mixed media features, like you know, Twice Upon a Time, and that yeah. have been out there. Yeah, I think a lot of times it'll be looking at the landscape of what we're already seeing and trying to figure out what else we might want to see. You know, the way that the way the Sony guys did when they got the Spider-Man title to do. They thought, well, we've seen Spider-Man done a bunch of different ways over the past 20, 30 years. Like, let's do it our way. You know, I think I think it'd be very fun to take something that the audience would immediately accept, but to produce it in a different way. You know, describe it in a different way that they hadn't seen before. Um, and when I think about like what a, a dream project might look like at the other end of it, yeah, I think maybe uh, Spider Verse might be the you know kind of sweet spot for me, you know, based on the kind of things I like to draw and the kind of you know story. You know, I, I mean, I'm, I'm in a very non-fictional kind of world right now because that's that's where the business has taken me. But, uh, but I'm a big science fiction fan, big comic book fan, you know, a big nerd for just silly, ridiculous. Like again, I came from Ren and Stimpy and I ended up doing slave documentaries for HBO. So I, I, I've been kind of pushed in directions. People have, have pushed me to kind of open up and to try different things and see what else I was made of. So I can see I was sort of more made of more stuff than Red and Stimpy, you know? Um, but I think, uh, again, I mean, as, as, a, as a black man, I mean, there's a lot of subject matter that hasn't been covered in movies yet. And I think I would probably find the best script writers I could 
And I went to school with quite a few um, really good scriptwriters, or people who became good scriptwriters later. My friend Don Cheadle, um, who was a, one of our roommates at college, uh, became a, a very well-known actor. And um, the entire time that he had been working on honing his craft, he was also writing, you know, writing his own material and working with his agents on, you know, getting feedback on that stuff. And with other, every time he got a new director on a new movie, he would show them his scripts and say, help me, help me, you know, edit this or bring it, you know, bring it to life in some way. And he's become one of the better screenwriting storytellers that I know of. So I think if I had a big budget, I probably would do a whole Cal Arts reunion maybe and just get all the folks from the from the old class because I've seen their work and I admire their work and I know that they could deliver. So um, uh, yeah, yeah. But who knows what the story would be? I don't know. You might you might be the one to, to come up with that one. Okay. Um, when you are producing an animation, what kind of music do you usually use? Um, do you tend to license like commercial music? Do you use production library music? Do you get a producer to compose a whole thing for you? Yeah. yeah. What music do you use to inspire you while you're storyboarding? Uh, I mean, I think if you're asking like on a pitch deck, is that which like what you use or just? Yeah. I mean, most of the time, I think you would probably just. Pick music that you were inspired by or other movies, or really, and then you might play that. You would have to certainly give that whoever that is credit. Um, I mean, I, I, my experience with that kind of thing is we would make reels of our movie like over and over and over again, and then we would just take scores from other films, throw them in there, and that's what we would do to score our movie, whatever fits the tone. And then obviously, again, my experience in a place like Pixar was like we hired a composer. They, and then they would compose. Sometimes there might be a song or two here and there. Um, but yeah, that, it, it was really that. But often, what I would find is, which is interesting, is that they would, if they liked a certain composer, like Finding Nemo in particular, my older brother wrote with listening to a certain composer um, and actually got him to com compose the movie just by putting all his music in the reels. And, and then they reached out and said, hey, would you be interested in exploring this movie? Yeah, I think it's similar. I think we we, have, we all have kind of a deep catalog of things that we love that we've heard way, way before we get into animation. And um, whatever's current that um, seems like it fits, it's okay as long as you're not trying to sell and make money from your pitches to use those, that music. And often those musicians are pretty thrilled that you would use it in that way or that you were inspired enough to use it. So sometimes if a job comes through like a commercial, and um, we've used, we've pitched it with a you know a particular musician that it, it might be possible to get that musician to come in and, and work with us and help us out. So the question was about um, students um, these days and learning how uh, uh, how much time they put into learning all the technology piece of, of animation as opposed to the, the craft of art piece of animation. Is it kind of what it is? And it's a strange balance that I've, I've, I've been teaching for about six years and. I think our whole department is searching for the right, the right balance of what to advocate, you know, and, and how much to to put on the students because they're quite burdened. You know, most students are are working full time to sort of to, to pay for their their studentship, you know, for the school they're going to. So they only have a certain number of hours in their week, and it ends up being a situation of like figuring out what's the best way to, to manage their time. Um, but they t our department does tend to go about half and half. You know, you have to start in the core first two years. You've got to learn all your drawing skills, right? You have to learn all your compositional skills. Because a lot of those concepts will, will carry over into other parts of the animation process in a way that it's much more surefire. Like, if you can do this, then you'll be able to do this other more complicated stuff. And then after, thir after year three, they slowly start to kind of like gain their, and you know, they're faster than we would have been. I mean, I'm sure, you know, picking it up a lot quicker than we do, but there's certain programs that the school recommends, and then they let, they, but they make sure that all the technology is available, so that if there's, for example, if everyone's learning Toon Boom, but there's a couple of students who would like to get into Blender, because that's, they see that in their future, then I'm happy to go ahead and do demos on Blender and start to, start them down that path, you know, or if there's seniors and they're trying to get their films, their senior thesis done, and they need to package it with a certain kind of software, the school will definitely support that, you know, and help them with, with instructors and also with some assistance, you know, to get that.
I know, it's true, right? I was just going to piggyback off of what you were saying. We, at, at Pixar, they would have these internships for different departments, and we had one in story. Yeah, a lot of training. And so we found, because we were doing all our storage boards in Photoshop, that when, when they were on the Cintiqs, they weren't really collaborating that much, and then they were getting lost with the, two, with the bells and whistles of Photoshop. So we actually, a couple of years later, decided, let's just get them back on paper. And we just had them storyboard on paper and get back to the basics, at least for the first, like, month and a half, and then they could go. And we found it helped a lot better. Like, they, they were focusing on what we were trying to teach them, the fundamentals of composition, staging, and wooding, and, and strong poses, and all that stuff. Storyboarding, would you say, a good stepping stone to get into, like, something like directing, and, like, a good foundation for other areas in animation, if you want to kind of maybe start with, like, writing, even, directing? Um, what you're describing is exactly my career. I went to storyboarding, and I was woefully underprepared at Pixar because it's not just that, it's, it's story structure and sitting in a room with the directors and the writers and figuring out what's broken in the story and the movie and I, I, I didn't know any of that. But I learned it over the 22 years I was there and then I left and then I started writing a bit more and so now I'm an assistant director on a feature and I, that is literally the path that I took and it's extremely helpful because all I've been doing for the last 22 years is story. And I can, I can certainly sit with a storyboard person or a, lay, or a layout person and um, I have very strong opinions about where that camera should be and what it should be doing. Yeah. But I also learned a hell of a lot from great people about just story, story yeah. structure, what yeah. works, what doesn't work. And so it's, I think it's one of the better ways to get yeah, sequential art, I think, in general, is, uh, is, is a lot, it's kind of an undersung skill set that makes it so that you are, it's very easy for you to understand the the direction of, uh, of a story that's being told cinematically. Um, yeah, it makes, it makes you have to think about all the things that a director would have to think about and make decisions. Yeah, well, you're, it, well there's an old saying, there's the, the story you write, the story you shoot, the story you edit. In animation, yeah. and as a storyboard person, you're doing all of those things all the time, all at once. Yeah, I did, like, I did start out and um, I was trying to remember yeah, if, if I did uh, storyboards on a, on a feature and yeah, had Fern Billy, the first Fern Billy, and the um, Baby's Kids, uh, which is one of the first uh, African American uh, features that, that came out of the US. It was a Paramount feature. I did a ton of boards on that and I completely had forgotten that that, that was part of it because we were also, because my, my, my partner and I were also animating on that job. So, uh, but the storyboarding was kind of what gave us later later uh, people I collaborated with confidence in me as in terms of story and directing and all that kind of stuff. It's just having done the boards.